Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. I'm Troy Moley, and thank you for joining us this week on Market Journal. Here we are, our first show of June, and 2020 is flying by. It is a year we are not going to forget anytime soon, that's for sure. Real quick, though, I do want to mention, as United States and global health officials continue to address the spread of COVID-19, UNL is also monitoring the situation. You can get updates at covid19.unl.edu, and we've also got a link on the Market Journal website. And beginning today's broadcast, the calendar only turned over to June a few days ago, but it's already feeling like summer in many parts of the state, with temperatures in the 90s. For instance, out in eastern Nebraska, where we are, normal temperatures this time of year are in the low 80s. And add to that, many fields way ahead of schedule in terms of planting. I spoke with Irrigated Cropping Systems Extension Educator Steve Melvin about some things producers and irrigators can do during a year when things are in the ground a little bit earlier than normal. He says paying attention to crop needs is more important than what the calendar says. Yeah, I always encourage people to look at it that way. And, and sometimes the even if the crop growth stage is pretty average, you know, the weather conditions are never, never average. Um, you know, if you average all the years together, you get the average, right? But every year is different. And, and this year certainly not being an exception to that. We've had some extended cold, cloudy periods in, in May that, that really, even though the crop was planted really early, kept the uh, water use down quite a bit, but we simply just didn't get any rain. And so a lot of people ended up putting a little bit of water on to get some herbicides in the ground and, uh, and maybe some crusting issues here more recently uh, with some soybeans that were planted. And so, you know, you always need to kind of adjust accordingly. Um, I guess we could have a debate whether, you know, getting herbicide activated is actually irrigation or whether it's, you know, part of the weed control program. But, but anyway, you know, it's, uh, it, it certainly got the pivots up and running and, and uh, ready to go for the year. And also when we were speaking earlier this week, you mentioned how you were headed out to the field. Just curious as to what are the, some of the things that you were looking for and how is the data different this year than last year or in past years? Well, last year was such a wet year. Um, you know, some pivots never even ran the entire season. And so we were more trying to find dry enough soil to get the, the crop planted. But this year, certainly the, it's been very, very dry. And you know, we had good moisture early, so there's a, a really good subsoil moisture there. Um, you know, particularly some of the fields that were tilled were a little dry on top and, and uh, guys thought they needed to run a little bit of irrigation water on it, but you know, you get down just a very few inches and particularly in the no-till planted fields, the moisture was excellent all the way to the top. And, and, uh, and so, so far, you know, it's been a, a great year. We, we've had an extended dry period, but um, you know, hopefully now we'll start picking up some more, some more thunderstorms, uh, you know, to get some, some water. Um, here recently were huge rains in parts of the state and, and uh, where I'm based at in the Platte Valley at Central City, you know, we certainly had the water come up and, and the groundwater levels come up again and, and uh, get some fields pretty wet that uh, just from groundwater. And yeah, in terms of soil water and soil moisture, how important is it to monitor that, especially in a year when the dates may be a little different? Well, I think it's always important and yeah, the dates may be a little bit different and, and, you know, whether it stays dry or gets wet, you know, and, and then even with thunderstorms, you know, on one end of the section, it rains and, you know, two miles away, it, it didn't. And so every field is different and we just need to monitor the soil moisture um, and, and soil water monitoring equipment is my preference of how to do that, but certainly ET, um, you know, looking at the crop water use and, and uh, a rain gauge can, can help a, a lot in that as well. But uh, every field needs to have somehow uh, monitor or try to estimate what amount of water is in the soil so we know when to, when to add some irrigation water. And finally, I know you just put that article out in Crop Watch. The article is, uh, it's, is it too easy to turn irrigation water on? Anything else that you want to leave our viewers with today, whether it's from that article or any other recommendations you may have for us? Well, yeah, the essence of that article was that 
you know, it's really easy and, you know, grab out your smartphone and open the app and push a button and start the center pivot. But we really need to keep in mind that, um, you know, kind of my question in there was if, if you had to go to the bank and take out, um, you know, eight or 10, $100 bills and go out and feed those into the pivot panel, would you want a little more soil water data or something to make sure that you really truly needed to start the system? And, and, and that was kind of the essence of the question, you know, think about it. It is expensive to run the pivot. You know, most people have, several pivots and, and uh, you know, you make that decision kind of quickly and move on sometimes, but, but it's an expensive decision to make and, and just make sure you've got some good data to do it. Uh, you know, figure out what you're going to use this year now before we get into the season and, and then uh, use that data to, to, you know, minimize irrigation costs as much as possible, but yet get optimum yields. Steve also recommends checking the pressure gauge on the center pivot if you do that, you'll save yourself a lot of trouble by fixing any problems now rather than putting it off until later in the growing season when water needs have increased. And now it's time for markets. This week I'm joined by Darren Fessler with Lakefront Futures and Options. And as we just mentioned in our last story, favorable weather has allowed farmers to get their crops in the ground at a breakneck pace. Corn emergence was reported at 88% and soybean emergence at 73% both ahead of the five-year averages of 79 and 47 percent, respectively. I started my interview with Darren by getting an update on crop conditions from around the state. So far, I'm not too concerned with what I'm seeing across Nebraska. Obviously, we have some issues in North Dakota that are going to linger on. But as far as Nebraska is concerned, uh, I think it went in the ground relatively uh, good in, in a quick, timely pace. Uh, obviously, we had some recent rains here that were probably a little bit too much for some producers. But all in all, I think that, you know, we may have to replant some of that. But, you know, all in all, right now, I think it's weather-driven markets and, and really the headlines, uh, what China may or may not do in the Hong Kong situation. But right now, the conditions are pretty good in my estimation. Yeah, it leads into my next question because, I mean, things are looking good. Emergence is ahead of schedule. But then that's overshadowed by the effects of COVID-19. And you have the trade uncertainty between the U.S. and China. So how's the market been responding to all that? Yeah, I think it's one of the things where the market's brushing it off a little bit about the, the whole China-U.S. relationship. I think it might be a longer-term story that, that you know, plays itself out. But right now, you look at what China does and not what China is saying, and I think that's going to be the indicator of what the market's looking at. Because even when China was saying, uh, you know, we're going to stop buying your pork, we're going to stop buying your beans, well at the end of the day, they were really buying our beans and still need our beans. And I, I think that's a story that's going to continue to play itself out here and continue to fuel a little bit of this bean market here as we move into some more weather uh, patterns here, as we maybe move later on in the growing year, if those weather patterns do pan out. I say we run into some weather issues that's much more favorable, I think, to beans right now than it is corn. And regardless of what the current environment is with the U.S.-China relationships, if they need those beans, they will step in and buy those beans. I'm fully, uh, fully confident of that. And yeah, let's look at pricing for a minute. With everything going on, could you give us a price forecast for uh, marketing 2020 corn and soybeans? What do you think? Yeah, I think right now, if you look at the November beans, we're somewhat in a trading range here. We've had decent volume here this week. And if you look at where the 50-day moving average is, if we can start getting some momentum above there on some good volume, that's really going to be indicative of what the future prices are going to do, for, especially for the bulls here. Now, on that November bean chart, we still have a gap here right above $9 at basically 903 and a half. I think that right there is a target for this market. I'm a, I'm a believer that gaps like to get filled sooner or later. Later. November's a long time away. We're still dealing with early June. Anything could happen to this stuff right now, but if you start to see weather come into play, you start seeing China come back into this market in a meaningful way, we're not very far from nine bucks. It, 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 we could get there in a couple of days if the market gets really spooked here, and hopefully it does, but right now I'm targeting some much higher levels than these beans. And I know that you're a big ethanol guy. We've had John a couple times, haven't had too many ethanol questions yet, so Excited for your uh, thoughts on this. So when you look at ethanol in terms of pre-COVID numbers and then look at where they've been over the last couple of months, what are you seeing and what do you think is going to be that sign that we've normalized again, you know, if that's even possible? Yeah, I mean, pre-COVID to where we are now, 
things that continue almost on a weekly basis continue to get better. You know, especially during we're opening more businesses up, the country's starting to open up a little bit more, and, and we're getting into that summer driving season as well. And you know, people have been cooped up; they're in the house just to get out and drive. They may not be going anywhere; they might just be driving around in a big circle, but they're going out and they're driving. So I, that's really encouraging. I think the biggest thing with ethanol right now is what does the USDA do with their numbers as far as ethanol production and how much corn are we using, not using, because that period of where we really had a bulk of that country shut down, we lost a lot of that production. So to really ramp that up in a meaningful way, you know, to get back to where we, you know, pre-COVID, it's going to take some time here, but I'd like the direction where we're on here. You look at not just ethanol, but look at fuel usage, look at airline fuel, uh, look at airline travel. So we're, we're, we're getting out and we're getting more and more active uh, as a country. So we're going in the right direction. It's just what kind of setbacks will we have maybe from the USDA if we're thinking, did we lose a 500 million bushels? Did we lose a billion? I, I think those are numbers are still really wish-washing a lot of analysts' uh, minds and opinions right now. I think we just have to continue watching these trends on a weekly basis here. And I think we'll be okay, especially if we run into some weather here, which, you know, somewhat we almost need a little bit of a weather hiccup uh, to help uh, the corn out market a little bit. But right now, I like the way the ethanol is moving. And finally, any marketing tips or risk management advice, any selling strategies, anything at all like that that you want to mention to us? As we get into more of a uh, seasonally bullish pattern for both the corn and the soybeans is if, if you know you've been undersold or under hedged in this market, it's just to establish some targets here and, and not get too crazy with the upside because volatility is still relatively low here. If you're stepping in selling calls here, I still would recommend just being very cautious because volatility is low. Wait for those volatility spikes. Buy some, buy some puts, sell some callers, do some caller type strategies. They establish some type of floor when these rallies do happen. Be in close contact with uh, whoever you're working with, and, but just have some targets in here is, is really the key thing here moving forward here, especially over the next probably two to three weeks. Next week, we'll be joined by Daryl Peel, a livestock economist with Oklahoma State University. If you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass your question along. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, as we've mentioned, many parts of the state feeling some pretty warm temperatures this week. What can we expect in the days ahead? Well, Troy, it's actually been a very hot week, and we've actually started to see more like summer-like conditions after some of the cool conditions we've seen during the month of May. A lot of wind, a lot of heat early in the week. We started to see the relative humidity levels really increase as we progress through the week and of course some other storms developed in the midweek period and we've been periodically been dealing with that severe weather since then and in fact we looked at uh, the thunderstorms that moved through the state on Wednesday evening into Thursday morning we had uh, wind gusts that were reported over 80 miles per hour in the Waco area some very significant type uh, activity and more of that's in, for, in the forecast, unfortunately. And then another fly in the ointment will be where does tropical storm crystal ball basically make landfall and what interaction will that have with the frontal boundary expected to come through our region next week? So we're going to go to the upper air models and see just how this may play out. Looking at today's upper air pattern, we see a big trough in the Pacific Northwest and, of course, a ridge over the center part of the country that was keeping all the warm air in our region. We're going to see some energy eject out of that trough during this next 24 hour period looking at thunderstorm development coming out of the Panhandle and moving up into South Dakota, heavier precipitation on the west side of the Rockies, and then we have crystal ball that was going to start to make its way toward the Gulf Stakes. And as we go into tomorrow, that trough digs a little bit deeper into the central Rockies. We see surface lows developing in the eastern portions of Wyoming and western South Dakota. I think we're going to see a widespread convective outbreak across South Dakota, potentially in the northwest and north central Nebraska. Some of that may make it down into the southern part of the state, but more importantly, on Monday, that trough starts to really the northern plains. That's going to start to push a cold front through the state. We have a surface low in the southwestern Kansas. It's going to help to feed up a little bit of moisture. We'll see some interaction on that front. But more importantly, the crystal ball will take a lot of that moisture away from this front until we see the front move into eastern Nebraska on Tuesday. And then with crystal ball, the remnants of it starting to move up into portions of Arkansas and the remnant lows associated with the upper air trough over Wisconsin. Pretty wide area of heavy precipitation over Iowa points to the north. 
And then we'll see that zone of flow flatten out somewhat as we go into Wednesday, bringing cooler air into our region, more seasonable temperatures return. And we'll see most of the moisture associated with the precipitation from crystal ball move over to the Great Lakes and Eastern Corn Belt. Drier weather materializes in our region. And on Thursday, we see another trough approach the Pacific Northwest. That's gonna to start to push the ridge uh, a little bit higher into the central plains, particularly in the central Rockies. So we're gonna to start to see a return to warm, particularly in Western Nebraska on Thursday maybe a few isolated showers across the southern plains. And then on Friday, that low starts to make its way inland into the Pacific Northwest. We're gonna repeat the process we've seen recently, and that is we're going to see warmer air move into our region with thunderstorm development starting to move into the Northern Rockies. And eventually some of that will spill out into the Northern Plains, particularly as we get into about Tuesday after this Friday. So we look farther into the forecast, the 8 to date 14 forecast shows from next Thursday to the following Tuesday that the ridge starting to move into our region with above normal temperatures spreading from the western high plains into the eastern high plains. And then we will also see precipitation below normal. But remember, as we get into Monday and Tuesday, we'll start seeing energy ejecting out of this system and most likely start to see precipitation break out in earnest across the northern plains, potentially starting to impact Nebraska also. So Troy, overall, it looks like we have to deal with a little bit of the warmth and stormy weather as we get in through this weekend, particularly in the northern and western part of the state. As we get into early next week, we see that moving into the eastern part of the state, and then we see a drier pattern evolve with cooler temperatures until we get into next weekend, and we repeat this process all over. Thanks, Al. Next up, there are many varieties of caterpillars that feed on seedling corn. Those that sever the stem are frequently referred to as cutworms. And if their numbers are abundant, that could mean a significant reduction in plant stands and total yield. That's why Nebraska Extension has the Cutworm Pheromone Trapping Network to help determine the presence of different species. Market Journal's Bill Dodd has the story. For several weeks, pheromone traps have been dispersed to several locations in eastern Nebraska in order to track some particular spring migrant pests to the Cornhusker State. In short, cutworms. This system has proven useful in determining the occupation of different species in the area. While this network can't be used to make any treatment recommendations, the system has served as a reliable early warning system that can give producers sound indication they should be monitoring their fields. For the past several years, we've had a network in eastern Nebraska of uh, Nebraska Extension fac faculty who put out pheromone traps for several economically important moths. And these are species that don't overwinter in Nebraska, but have to migrate up each, each uh, spring. And so we monitor those to, to get a general idea of their presence and whether we should be directing our scouting efforts toward those species. Their, their densities can vary from year to year, and it varies somewhat on which way the wind blows in the spring, whether we get some of these and what, what's going on to the south of us too. Extension researchers are currently monitoring three different species, the true armyworm, the black cutworm, and the variegated cutworm. However, Robert still stresses the importance of scouting for species that do overwinter in Nebraska and have the potential to invade other crops as well. We have several types of cutworms and other caterpillars that overwinter in Nebraska that don't migrate up each spring. And th th in some ways, those are more dangerous because they're partly grown caterpillars these other things like the black cutworm, they have to lay eggs in the spring and we have small caterpillars that start off and do a little bit of leaf feeding. And then when they get about half grown, they're big enough to cut through the stem of the, the corn plant and kill it. Uh, some of the other cutworm species that overwinter, uh, as soon as they become active and as soon as corn emerges, they can start cutting the plants and killing them. So the main, the main point is, regardless of what we see in our pheromone traps, growers should be checking their fields as corn emerges uh, for cutworms, other caterpillars, and other insects early in the spring here. Each different species will inevitably have an environment in which they are particularly suited to thrive. When scouting for these pests, it would be prudent to investigate in areas near fields that may be considered high risk for these species to multiply. Well, it, it varies by the type of cutworm. The black cutworm, when it comes up in the spring, likes to lay eggs in winter annual fields that have a lot of winter annual weeds or maybe crop residue uh, that, that they'll start off in. And then when we prepare the field to plant, we may terminate those weeds or till, and that drives the cutworms to start feeding on corn. 
Some other species may be attracted to, to grassy plants. Army worms are attracted to grassy plants to lay their eggs. So either small grains or possibly uh, grass cover crops could encourage army worms. And all, all these cutworms are, are never really widespread problems, but individual fields each year will have damage. So it's, it's not a major problem, but we can't predict too well which fields are gonna cause problems. Uh, so you really need to scout all your fields as corn emerges. Producers should also be scouting their fields once to twice a week as plants begin to emerge. But furthermore, when scouting your fields, there are definite telltale signs of infestation to be on the lookout for. Just look for early, early evidence of insect feeding. Some of these species are not active during the day, so really to find out what's going on, you may have to dig around the base of the plant. It's important to see what, identify what species you have and how big they are, and that, that can tell you how much longer they potentially can damage the crop. And then we have thresholds for all the cutworm species that if we have from three to 5% of the plants are cut at the base of the, the stem or at the soil level, and the, the, the insects you find are an inch or more or less, that would be when you want to treat. When the caterpillars are getting over an inch, they're, they're getting toward the end of their life cycle and it may be too late to treat. Uh, and plus it's harder to kill big caterpillars. While research continues through the cutworm pheromone trapping network, Robert also emphasizes that there are a number of other pests to be vigilant of as your crop begins to emerge. When you're scouting as corn emerges, there are other insects like uh, wireworms and white grubs that can kill germinating, germinating seeds and you have poor stands. For those insects, we don't have post-plant treatments since they're in the soil. Uh, but the main decision is whether or not to replant at this time. And also in some cases for the wireworms and some white grubs uh, that have multi-year life cycles, those fields might be uh, watched for next year. And if you had problems this year, you likely have problems next year. Maybe think about control measures next year, uh, particularly if you're, gonna, if you're gonna plant back into corn. When working toward the goal of cutworm control, it's imperative to identify the problem early and keep a close eye on how the infestation is affecting your crop. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. If you're interested in varieties of insecticides that are effective against cutworms and corn, you can visit UNL's Department of Entomology website at entomology.unl.edu and use the search bar to find more. Finally today, most ranchers want to make sure they've got the best tools for the job, but that doesn't always mean buying the latest and greatest in agricultural technology. Market Journal's Maddie McIntosh spoke with Nebraska Extension Beef Systems Educator Aaron Berger on what producers should consider before purchasing new equipment. Nebraska Extension Beef Systems Educator Aaron Berger knows costs are important to a ranching operation. A major one of these costs is equipment, and it's important to evaluate whether new equipment is worth the price. After feed, usually labor and equipment is the second largest expense. And when we look at the cost of new equipment today, especially in relation to the value of production, um, we've really seen those started to, I think, increase over time. What I mean by that is the cost of equipment versus value of production can get out of whack. And so paying attention to that, I think being creative, uh, really evaluating are there some things I could do differently with my equipment that would reduce my overall equipment cost. And some of that may be changing production management. Uh, some of that may be just thinking about how to share equipment or lease equipment, do something different than what you're currently doing. There are five major factors that make up the real cost of the equipment, which all together form the acronym DIRTY. So I think when you think about a piece of equipment, you really need to ask, you know, what is the cost of owning this piece of equipment? That dirty five factor, depreciation, interest, repairs, tax, and insurance. And then what's the value I'm getting back from owning that piece of equipment? What's it doing for me? If that piece of equipment is not returning me more value than what it costs, then I need to evaluate how do I eliminate that piece of equipment or replace it with a piece of equipment that does capture value for me, does return more than its cost. And that dirty acronym, depreciation, interest, repairs, taxes, and insurance. Those are five things that go into ownership of equipment. Depreciation is the big expense. And again, if I go out and I buy a new piece of equipment, my depreciation initially is pretty high. 
as that piece of equipment gets older, then my repair bill probably starts to go up because uh, everything's starting to wear out. I'm going to need to do some work with that. So the total of those five things, depreciation, interest, repairs, taxes, and insurance, somewhere, a ballpark estimate, somewhere 18 to 20%. I think I just encourage people to think about that, those values as they think about equipment and what they have invested there. Alongside using Dirty, producers need to ask themselves some serious questions before purchasing equipment for their cow-calf operations. So I think you need to ask yourself, what does this piece of equipment do for me in the operation? Is this something I use routinely? Is it really needed? And in those cases, could I rent that piece of equipment? Could I share a piece of equipment with somebody else? And that can really provide maybe an option for you to buy a piece of equipment, maybe in conjunction with a couple of neighbors. Maybe it's something that you use just a couple uh, weeks of the year. Uh, could there be an opportunity to lease a piece of equipment and uh, use it for a set amount of time? You know, what are the things that you can do with that piece of equipment instead of maybe needing to own it outright that could help you use that resource more effectively? Lastly, Aaron says keeping track of what you own is important so you don't lose out on the value of old equipment. In some cases, we can see equipment inventories creep over time. The challenge with that is over time, we can start to accumulate more and more pieces of equipment and we can have a really large equipment inventory. And the value of that equipment in comparison to what we're getting from the production of it can sometimes get out of whack. And so really trying to be efficient with what we have, thinking about what does this equipment do for me and really can I justify having it. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Maddie McIntosh. Thanks, Maddie. For more information like this, be sure to check out the Beef Watch podcast, which we've also linked onto the Market Journal website. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media so you can join in on the conversation. And don't forget, you can get the latest updates on the coronavirus outbreak at covid19.unl.edu. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.